This season has been a really good year for growing the range of brassica family plants, such as cauliflower, kales, and cabbages. I think that a lot of this was due to the fairly mild weather that we've had for most of the growing season, a reasonably consistent supply of rain, and a better watering system for when it was dry. For the most part, I've been able to keep the pest damage under control, and there has not been any significant disease or mineral deficiency issues among these crops. The different types of large brassica plants were all grown from the same seed and transplanted at the same time into four of the outside family scale gardens. Even with the different layouts and the different approaches to soil management and fertility across the four gardens, most of these plants are growing well and look great. This is possibly the best crop of brassicas that I've ever grown, my most successful year of growing this important family of vegetables. It is so wonderful to see the health and vigor of these crops and to realize just how big and healthy they can be. But this side-by-side -side comparison offers a chance to observe the differences between the gardens, with some interesting observations about how the plants can negatively affect each other. There is quite a wide range of different brassica crops that I grow in these gardens, and there is a lot more that I could grow. But it can be difficult to fit them all in, with different space requirements, different planting dates, and different lengths of time that they need to grow in the garden before harvesting. And a lot of the crops can be sown multiple times during the season, with different varieties available to stretch the harvest times throughout a lot of the year. There are so many options and different ways to approach this, but this year I've decided to sow three different batches of the larger brassica plants, and to try to fit in the smaller, faster growing brassica plants in among these three main batches. I sowed cauliflower and broccoli plants earliest in the season, which were transplanted into these four gardens in the third week of April, and then were harvested at the end of June and into the first half of July. About two months later, in the second week of June, I transplanted in Brussels sprout plants, as well as a type of summer kale, and two varieties of autumn cabbages. I have been harvesting from these kale plants since late July, and one variety of cabbage was already harvested in early autumn. The other variety of cabbage should be ready from about now until late autumn, but the Brussels sprout plants won't be producing buds until well into the winter. A month later, during the second week of July, I transplanted the third batch of uh, winter cabbage and overwintering varieties of kale and purple sprouting broccoli into the same four gardens. This variety of cabbage will be available for harvesting over winter, with the kale and purple sprouting broccoli plants producing tender sprouts well into the spring. This diverse range of brassicas have all been quite successful in the intensive garden, producing strong plants for the most part. They were all transplanted into three of the double dug beds, with the closest spacing between plants of all of the four gardens. The harvest so far has been larger than in the other gardens, at least when calculated as a yield per square meter or area, but the individual heads of broccoli, cauliflower and cabbage have been smaller on average than the other gardens. This is what I would expect from this density of plantings. The second variety of autumn cabbage will soon be ready for harvesting, and two of the plants are really large, most likely helped by the empty space created after the harvest of the earlier cabbages. But the other two plants of the same variety are quite a bit smaller, likely due to competition from the adjacent Brussels sprout plants, which seems to have stunted or delayed these two cabbage plants. This is interesting as the Brussels sprout and cabbage plants were transplanted into the garden at the same time. It seems that small differences in the strength and vigor of otherwise quite similar plants can imbalance the competition and lead to big differences in how well individual plants can grow. This same set of brassica plants were arranged a bit differently in the no-dig garden. This garden has one large bed devoted to the full range of this family of plants, with cross rows for these larger brassicas, with each plant having slightly more space than in the intensive garden. Some of these plants do seem to be larger than in the intensive garden, but others are significantly smaller, as it seems I misjudged the layout of this bed. I could have transplanted each of the three different batches as a group together so that all of the plants of the same age were beside each other. But instead I grouped the plants according to when they would be harvested, thinking that larger sections of the bed would be cleared and replanted at some point later in the season or next year, and I made a mistake on this. The late planting of purple sprouting broccoli ended up being squished between the summer kale and the autumn cabbages, which had been transplanted about two months earlier. And the winter cabbage ended up being squished between the vigorous Brussels sprout plants and the autumn cabbage plants. These younger plants struggled to become established with this close competition, even though the older plants were at least 60 centimeters or two feet away. 
The same range of brassicas in the polyculture garden had similar issues to the no-dig garden, although the layout of the plants was quite different. I haven't really figured out how best to position these larger brassica plants within this garden, where I'm trying to maintain a degree of crop rotation, but also trying to mix in a range of different plants. This season I decided to devote one of the six large beds of this garden to these brassica plants, which really doesn't fit into the polycropping methodology of this garden. These various brassica plants were randomly placed across the bed, with the first batch being transplanted into a bed of established salad greens. These early cauliflower and broccoli plants really suffered from this interplanting into an existing crop, and I should have cleared a larger space for them sooner. This was probably made worse by not enough fertility, and neither crop produced anything close to what I was able to grow in the other gardens as a result. The second batch of plants, including the summer kale, the autumn cabbages, and the Brussels sprouts, generally did better, as the salad greens had mostly been cleared by then. But the last batch of winter kale, cabbage, and purple sprouting broccoli struggled with the competition from the more established plants, and may not produce very well at all. Each of these plants that is still growing in this garden has more space than they have in the other three gardens, which is really benefiting some crops, but other plants don't seem to be able to make use of this space. I think that the random interplanting of these different crops is a key issue here, perhaps made worse by a not enough fertility, and this is something I'm going to have to rethink for next season. The layout of the extensive garden is quite different from the other gardens, with the brassica rotation set up in three long rows. The middle row had been planted with the first batch of cauliflower and broccoli plants, and this was replaced later in the season with a variety of smaller, fast-growing brassicas. One of the outside rows was planted with all of the tall, long-season crops, including the two types of kale, the Brussels sprout plants, and the purple sprouting broccoli. The third row was planted with autumn and winter cabbages, arranged in a row from early to late harvest. Each of these plants has significantly more space than is available in the intensive or in the no-dig garden, but slightly less space than is available in the polyculture garden. The fact that the middle row was planted first, and cleared fairly early, seems to have given more space to the outside rows, which were planted later. All of this really seems to have made a difference, and the plants in this garden are generally larger than they are in the other gardens, and in some cases quite a bit bigger, and they look healthier. This is especially the case with the late crops of purple sprouting broccoli, the winter kale, and especially a few of the winter cabbages, which are all really large plants with huge leaves. It's remarkable how large some of these plants can get when the fertility and weather is good and they aren't suffering from competition. Interestingly, the winter cabbage plants are quite different sizes along the row, with the larger plants generally clustered at one end and a few smaller plants at the other. This could be due to random differences in the viability of the individual plants, or some underground root or pest issues, but I suspect that there may also be a variation in the soil fertility along the length of the row. With such a small sample size and so many variables, it's difficult to come to any definitive conclusions about all of this, but I have made some interesting observations, or at least reinforced observations that I've made in the past. The larger brassica plants seem to have vigorous root systems that can occupy the soil quite far beyond the above ground part of the plant. Because of this, it's better to avoid planting young plants beside the established plants, as they don't seem to be able to get what they need from the soil. Different types or varieties of plants seem to be much more vigorous than others, even though they may be closely related, and this can cause unexpected competition. The size of each of the brassica plants generally depends on the space that it has to grow in, but not always, and the more space typically produces larger plants that seem to be healthier and more resilient. But maximum yields for a given area can generally be achieved by growing more plants that are spaced closer together. As with many things, there is a balance that can be achieved here, and it generally depends on the amount of fertility that is available, and also the type of crop, and even perhaps the specific variety of the crop that is being grown. It is generally better to group different plants that are transplanted into the garden at the same time, but it's also useful to group these plants according to how long they are going to be in the garden. Trying to achieve both of these can be difficult, especially if I want to grow many of the wide variety of different types of brassica plants. If I want to keep all of these related crops in one section of the garden, in order to maintain an effective crop rotation, it can be quite difficult to figure out how to fit everything in. Essentially, this is a design challenge. 
How do I incorporate all these different issues into an appropriate planting plan for the gardens, especially when so many of the different crops that I want to grow belong to this diverse family of crops? With larger gardens and market gardens, this can be a lot easier to work out, as each bed can be devoted to a different crop. With smaller gardens such as these, it can be much more difficult to fit everything in, especially when there's a need or desire to grow as much as possible. It's likely easier in climates with hard cold winters, where there is generally only one crop grown per bed each season. In temperate climates like here in Ireland, where quite a few brassica crops can be productive right through the winter, it can be more complicated to fit everything in. In trying to balance all these issues, I think I have been most successful this season with the design and layout of the extensive garden. The layout of the brassica section of this garden into three widely spaced rows seems to work quite well, with different crops grouped according to how long they are in the soil. The layout of both the intensive and the no-dig gardens can be improved, but the close planting really depends on good fertility levels in these gardens, and I need to pay more attention to which crops are growing beside each other. The polyculture garden definitely needs a radical redesign. I'm planning to abandon the conventional crop rotation system for this garden, and to try to mix up these larger brassica plants with the other crop families. This is a more difficult design challenge, as all these issues are still likely going to arise, with the added complexity of the mix of so many different plants together. In the other gardens, the aim is generally to get the best result for all of the plants. But perhaps with the polyculture garden, I need to take a more casual approach to all of this, and accept that competition, diverse conditions, and unexpected results are all part of this methodology. And this would require a different way of thinking and a different approach to the design of the planting plan of this garden.